you had a very heavy day. The whole week was tough. I fully am aware. I also want to inform you that now, tomorrow, day after tomorrow, <coughs> and then you know, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, it's actually resting. You have to pick up your notes, read, and, and uh, sort of um, compose yourselves. Because um, right now we have to, this is the end of the midterm, and a very important subject. I'm having great difficulty to express it. Because there is not enough material, orthodox text on that subject, and whichever, whenever we have something in that subject, it's actually glorifying humanity, humanism, rather than the Christian concept of art and culture. Father Faisi, do you hear it? Yes. Thank you. Now, the subject is this. The arts and the pastor. And your will be required, your test, to answer various questions based on this text. <clears throat> there are certain points which you have to understand in order to pass. I'll warn you which are the major points. First of all is this. Arts or artistic expression of a beautiful feeling or harmonious movement in the soul of any human being from the very beginning of time was associated with religion because religion is a way to or expression of acknowledging higher powers or creator God who created the whole world harmoniously we do not know, for example, which was first, the idea of worship or music, <coughs> music or worship. The whole phenomena of um, worship is bound up with the idea of beauty. In fact, God, according to the Holy Fathers, God is creator of truth and also beauty. Dostoevsky said, and you'll be required to know that statement, that beauty will save the world. By beauty is meant the expression of godliness in earthly terms for, in, uh, for earthly people, uh, human beings, in the, spare, in the span of time here upon this earth as the beginning for eternity. Eternity, as far as we know, or afterlife, is bound up with beauty. This expression in human beings uh, of expressing, wanting to express beauty, harmony, and so on, is inborn in man. <coughs> According to the Holy Fathers, it stems from paradise. And it will be in full splendor after the second uh, coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So therefore beauty today, now, in human understanding, is a hint of paradise. Is memories of the pa paradise lost <coughs> and in anticipation of paradise to come. This beauty, <coughs> or concept of harmony, and refinement, elegance, and um, truthful expression of exalted state, or dualistic state of man, this very expression <coughs> has been the main uh, element in worship, in religion. The more refined the cultures, the more refined the art. The cruder the culture, the cruder the arts. We know some primitive um, uh, cultures. They have all these drum beats and all that. Some of them are, <coughs> uh, some of them is first, it's a little difficult for us to understand. <coughs> our standard is European concept. <coughs> but it certainly <coughs> is different between those drum beats and some kind of a 
violent concerto of Mozart or Tchaikovsky. We also know this, and that is important for us to know, that human soul worships God through beauty, truth, and uh, godliness. To human soul, it is understandable, that is, the human psychology, the human psyche, understands, feels beauty without words. It does not require <coughs> much words. When you see some kind of a beautiful painting or something beautiful, you don't need words to describe it. It's there. We apprehend it with our inner sense of um, um, beauty. We don't have to need words. Same thing with music. Architectural buildings. We don't need words. We see it. We apprehend with one, say, a picture is worth a thousand words. So in other words, it is a language. Beauty is a language. A great composer, perhaps the greatest composer of all times, Johann Sebastian Bach, used instruments and tones and uh, modes in order to convey, that is, use them as a language. That a cello, sound of cello has one particular message. A violin, flute, it has a particular thing. So when he wants to say a certain phrase from scripture that talks about trumpet, that talks about um, exaltation or uh, rage of heaven or something, he uses instruments. And when you hear this without words, you get the point. In opera, they even use this same principle <coughs> by so-called leitmotif. They use a melodic line or just few bars in order to hint a certain element. Let's say the heroine comes, and before she comes, you, you have those, those few uh, no, bars coming, some notes. And you already feel, aha, she's about to come. Her element is present. The usage, in other words, it's a language. So therefore, it is important for Orthodox Christians to realize that worshiping God involves beauty. When I, I repeat myself all the time, because I want that idea to come across. When we come to church and we pray, we are utilizing our faculties that uh, function through beauty. Poetry, for example, is the closest, perhaps, to all of the arts, to the soul, except for music, is when words, not only words conveying a certain message, but order of them, or rhyme, or rhythm, or metaphors, or color utilized, has stronger meaning than just regular words. That's the difference between the poetry and prose. That Prose is what, you know, newspapers written in the <coughs> it's prose. But poetry uses various methods uh, by changing word order or giving various metaphors. They evoke a sense of beauty that somehow harmonizes with us and we see a different picture. You take some kind of a poem um, and you read this, you, you know this, you read this, but if you trans, transliterate it or uh, tr translate in terms of just simply describing uh, as regular as poet, um, prosaic, you get a different idea. Poetry touches the soul. Therefore, the pastor, an orthodox pastor, cannot be insensitive or de dead to the sense of beauty and harmony. All right, having said that much, the next point. Next point is this. The pastor who, whose job is to inspire, to move, to to promote heavenly concepts for the 
for the uh, his spiritual son or daughter. <coughs> Pastor is handling a realm where the soul understands more than words can say. They say this, that music is the closest to the soul because music is bound up with time. Ears are bound up with time, while sight, eyes, with space. Space is bound up with materialism or with the, the idea of extending oneself out. While soul or sound, music, is on the contrary, goes inside. Therefore, the pastor in the North Church, Church is sort of a priest of arts, where he utilizes that element of aesthetic aspect in order to save a soul. But the whole idea of saving a soul indicates it by this phrase that there is something ugly from which he takes the soul away and brings it some kind of harmonious beauty. The pastor, as I said, is a priest of these arts within the church, and therefore the church, the external aspect of the church, is adorned with beauty. As a rule, orthodox principle, starting from Byzantium, of course in ancient times, but Byzantium was necessary when Christians became free, they were able to express that pathos, that feeling, that um, a state of apprehending reality, which they had formed in their mind while in catacombs. The sound of angelic singing, the movement of um, spiritual movements in their community had to be expressed so that the mobs, the unchristian, unsuffer unsuffering souls that have been outside the barbaric world, that they'll have to <coughs> understand. That's why with Byzantium, the beginning occurs with Christians to adorn the <coughs> temples in such a way that the mayor entrance, the mayor looks inside, whatever occurs, will hint at the other world from which Jesus came. Therefore, the architectural structure of the temple, a church, although basically uh, is uh, that of the Old Testament, you know, the temple, the Holy of Holies in the uh, court, uh, it's from there, but now they had to use that in order to convey a worldly message to those people who are far away from this experience. And therefore, the usage of let's say, pictorial art, the icons. Icons are window to heaven, sure, but they are visual aids. They are implements by which a message comes across. When a person came in the beginning with Byzantium church, they would come in, the first thing he's baffled with the depiction of saints or uh, scenes in the Old Testament <coughs> or New Testament, uh, Jesus, rather of God's angels and saints, his, his eyesight received a message of the gospel. But it was the attempt was not just to make a picture, like cartoons, which is vulgar, but to hint through those, that depiction, that there is another world, a refined world, from which Jesus came. Therefore, the idea of otherworldliness is what's stored in church. The icons, the singing. Therefore, the icons could not be depicting the daily reality of, of a butcher shop or something like that. It didn't fit. Same thing 
the music had to be refined, had to be uh, uh, hinting at celestial realms whence Jesus came. The very uh, scripture, the Psalms, and um, the uh, biblical language was, is a poetical language. And therefore, they utilize this poetic language in their hymnography, <coughs> in the description, or in the uh, various hymns and songs and stichiris, and all that, which would hint at another element, just like a poem. You read a poem, and it's quite a difference. If you like poetry, you can see quite a difference. You read a poem, and then some kind of a, uh, description the prosaic description is a big difference. You see that there are hints in poems, the word order, the metaphor, the, uh, the rhythm, the rhyme, it all adds to a particular message, which is to be not of this world. All the language in, in the uh, uh, church is poetic. That's why you cannot read the epistles as if you read the newspaper. Like the same thing you read in the newspaper, the murderer, so the murderer came and then the policeman came and then the gun was dead. And, and so the same way, you cannot read the epistles in the same way, there is objection. They, some people say, doesn't it therefore estrange the man from daily reality? That Vatican II is concerned, was concerned with that. That idea is that well, all this poetical, all this other world, this stuff in churches is actually moving people away from the daily reality of uh, society today, which should be elevated. But what are you going to elevate with? The result is they did not elevate the society. On the contrary, they lowered the church standard. Now a Roman Catholic church is falling apart. Well, once there was a big thing, but now it's actually one of and interesting, even the theologians, all oh, that, they copy, they mimic orthodox. They use the term, they don't say any mass anymore, say liturgy. Mm. The whole city, they all crazy, they go crazy about icons. They spend millions of dollars to present paint icons. They adore the, the, the Byzantine icons. Clearly, they lost. So therefore, the, the embodiment of um, orthodox or Christian apprehension of reality should be in church in such a way that the soul will deliberately be moved outside of the world. Whence came Jesus? In other words, it's a stepping stone to heaven. It came from heaven and then so to heaven. Of course there are various styles since the 2000 years of Christianity, various styles. But the whole idea of art was to of this ecclesiastical art was to move the soul to the other world whence Jesus came from. Therefore, icon is a window into heaven. Next question. The phenomena, the old, the pagan, <coughs> Grecian idea of theater. Our expert on ancient Greek culture, Father Damascene, is uh, washing dishes, he doesn't, I can say things, he doesn't have to, oh, um, <coughs> There was a, I don't know whether he mentioned, but there was, since time immemorial, such a thing as theater, or present, so, certain presentation, some enactment for a, to evoke a particular message, idea, feeling, or whatever. From all, in all cultures, it's there. But the most refined one was in Greece where they had these plays, Electra uh, and uh, Odin's Rex and so on, whose, mostly tragedies, whose purpose was to evoke in the viewer a sense of, um, of something extremely important, like tragedy, you know, people dying and so on, it's very important, it's a question of life and death. But so that the viewer, seeing this, will, by participating, sort of viewing it, will at the same time get rid 
of that element which bothers him. That was um, uh, catastrophism. The idea was this. They were religious plays. People would come like on a pilgrimage. They would come and sit there and they would have special sandwiches. They would feed them and all that. And they would stand there and those actors would enact all kinds of <coughs> tragic things and all these poses which are symbolic and all uh, spoke to a certain uh, message in the symbolism in the, in, the, in the poses and positions. And the person, people who come to watch, they would take part in it and would get spiritual transformation. They would get a certain change in their attitude. If they had for, for a certain hatred for something, now they would get rid of it. Or certain fears, they would get rid of it. <coughs> they would have a different understanding. Now this idea was carried over to, of course, Christian society. But Christian society rejected theater for one reason, one big reason, because the church system functioned as this theater. That's why St. John of Kronstadt <coughs> could not tolerate theater, because he said, they compete with us. In other words, it's the divine drama. And the church construction, as you know, it is like a theater. You even have a curtain. <laughs> the, but it is divine. It is not play acting. Just like in those ancient times. Those actors that stood there and wept and all that business, they actually were performing a particular job. They were vehicles by which people would associate with their spiritual, with their state and would either get rid of certain things or acquire a particular impression and so on. It was the audience, the person was supposed to partake, be moved by that which took place, there in, took place in those pagan spectacles. And Christianity was, after it became free, and you know it was in Greece, and it was <coughs> in the time where Christianity, that is the pagan uh, culture, reached its height. If you read Gregory the Theologian, you can see clearly how tra traumatic, or rather how theatrical, to quote, how dramatic he expresses some ideas. <coughs> some of his editions are filled with these phrases which came straight into our uh, church canons, the Hall of Paschal Canon, Christmas Carol, canons, you know, during Matins. It all comes from St. John, St. Gregory Theologian, who was very much involved in presenting Christian message to the mentality at that time of the Greeks. So he was aware, in fact, very often all these, all these deities are mentioned, all these Venus and so on, they're all mentioned. Not in order to acknowledge them, no, but to use this very principle which they understand, by which they could, he could come across with that spiritual message. It's interesting that the whole world muses were sort of deities of inspiration. The word music <laughs> comes from that. The museum comes from that. It's muses. He talks about evoking the muses, the inspiration, so that Christians can do things. In other words, this is the, what's expected in the test. Christianity is divided into two categories, right? You can see catacomb, Byzantium, and post-Byzantium, which is now, or actually post-Christian era, which we experience now. So in catacombs, everything was, was, was um, concealed like an embryo. They developed the whole thing. When they became free, <coughs> they came out of the catacombs, mind you. Their job was to missionize, to bring the good tidings to the people of these various temperaments, these various cultures that people experienced. They had to make the message of Christianity palatable and understandable to these people of the Greek, Rom uh, uh, Roman Greek uh, culture. So they had to use their language. And thus, the liturgics came out of that. The subject of liturgics we'll discuss with Father Girasi. But for our purpose, 
when the question rises with arts, it is very necessary for us to acknowledge that the church service is bound up that which is, so now we understand the theater. Now the key phenomenon is this. <coughs> Byzantium <coughs> opened up otherworldliness, and the best way they can, in the language of that refined culture then, to the barbarous, all kinds of nation, uh, nations and peoples and so on. They opened up, they developed a language, both um, uh, through uh, speaking and language of art, uh, language of music, uh, theater, and so on. They developed a language by which this beauty, other world, the beauty, would be transferable so that people with various stages, whatever their culture they had, how, no matter how primitive, they would understand. The function of missionaries was not to change people. There was not to change, but confront them with the message of Jesus Christ. And they had to use the language of those people, and not necessarily in through utterance. The language of art, the language of music, the language of architecture, custom, and so on. And they did this job. And then approximately, at the, tur at the turn of, of the first millennium, then occurred the beginning of apostasy, which finally finalized in 1054, when the Roman Pope, with his um, armies, ecclesiastical armies, decided to build a society the, or Christian expression, not with gazing into the other world, but making it earthly. Thus, they decided to make a society, a religious society, a whole empire, based on the earthly things. And thus they gave rise to the so-called Renaissance. And the Renaissance is nothing else, the word Renaissance means rebirth, which is rebirth of pagan principles that was before they were baptized, before they were Christianized, before they were confronted with otherworldliness. It's undoing the job of Byzantine missionaries. And the result was the return <coughs> to the pagan principle very clearly could be identified through, for example, arts. In the pictorial arts begins the element of realism. Perspective pops up. The attempt to make figures look as real as possible with all the warts, <coughs> with all the broken teeth, and all that. Well, before that, art served heaven. So obviously, in heaven, you won't have warts and, <coughs> and broken teeth, and so on. The ideal was to present to the ideal form, as is in heaven, or will be in heaven. Now, they're not interested anymore. I always use that, that uh, analogy, if you go to, uh, you go to museums, to go to the statues, and take a look at this ancient Greek statues and ancient Roman statues. And you'll see that the, in Greek statues, the attempt was to, per, to present, to represent a particular person in its ideal form. These God-looking people, you know, it's refined people. And in the Roman um, sta statues, there is an attempt to portray a person the way he is, with broken nose, with cross-eyed, and so on. And thus, the two trends, sort of two ideas. The Orthodox remain gazing into paradise. The, the West Renaissance began to develop the earth. That's the key. In the Byzantium, they continued gazing into paradise through arts. In the West, they began to <coughs> develop the earth with all its worldly, earthly passions, <coughs> reasons, and so on. That's reflected in literature. The literature in the patriarchal societies we talked before, 
was of course all ecclesiastical, it was churchly. They were not interested in worldly things, news, sort of newspapers, murders, and all that. They were not concerned. That was not a boring thing, because it's all earthly, fallen stuff. They were interested in refined things. So they would write that which is, as New York Times says, no newsworthy of news something. Read the New York Times. Ah, all the news that's fit, that's fit to print. Right. In other words, only that which is fit. There are lots of stuff, but we don't have to bother with that. So what we have to bother is something that is of sensual nature. So therefore, the hagiographer, hagiography, or hagiographical literature was bound up with presenting the saint as an ideal from the past and where he's going. They were not interested whether he goes to bathroom or so on. They're not interested. They were interested to present that state of a man who is created an image of God, is pre presently here upon this earth, in fallen earth, and through combat, unseen warfare, changing himself, he comes into the glory of the image into which he was created in the first place. Therefore, our geography was not interested to beautify things. The essence was already beautiful, full of beauty. <coughs> After Renaissance, they began to beautify things because they were worldly, earthly. Because the concern was to, the focus was on the earth. So obviously, it's ugly, full of warts and so on. You need jazz it up. So this jazzing up revealed itself in endless amount of unnecessary adornment in the West. And we have these legends. Endless of our legends, like Saint Sebastian was uh, tied to the uh, tree, and they threw um, uh, arrows, uh, arrows at him, and so he is tormented there, and he hears the voice of God and he goes to heaven. And in the new verse is that he stands there and his sweat falls down and flowers come out. And there are beautiful flowers, and then there's lizards come out, and lizards carry this thing, and then all kinds of things that's weaved into this in order to make it pretty. Jazz it up. Why? Because the interest in the earth has its limitations, because we're creating the image of God. You understand? And our description of earthly things, I mean the earth, the divine <coughs> things, are limited because we're earth so earthly. Therefore, the arts depicting beauty depends on the moral ascent of both the creator and the apprehender. Do you understand? Say that again. Say that again. The, the moral uh, state of a person who both creates and apprehends is the element that give, opens up realms <coughs> that revealed to him the truth about reality. We, in our 20th century, who, have, who are the result of this apostasy, just a minute, we're the result of this apostasy, have gradually, or rather rather fast, lost not only the longing for this otherworldliness, which you, which is revealed to you to the measure of your moral perfection. But we began to forget it and begin to glorify that which is earthly. Rembrandt. Do mm -hmm. you understand? Mm -hmm. And thus, it's earthly. It's fallen. It's a nice quote, but it's fallen. I'll come to this in a minute. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, the, when a person prays to God, he encounters war within himself. This war refines his spiritual state. This refinement a, helps him to view or apprehend reality in more refined, idealistic way. The more he prays, the more he fasts, the more he disrobes of his fallen nature, thus human aspect, 
the closer or the more the other world reveals himself. Take life, saying Makar is the great. Who read his book, Hamilton's Makar is the Great? Okay? You know what I'm talking about. Saint Sir from Sarov. We know Saint Sergius Radish saw different colors, a rainbow. He, he was seen in uncreated light. Every time he served liturgy, he, the, an angel served with him. Only once his disciples saw that angel and was petrified, and St. Sergius turned to him and said, Be calm. That angel is always present in church whenever they serve. An angel was epitome of beauty, because it's a servant of God. So therefore, arts are bound up hand and foot with the moral ascent of the <coughs> of both the creator and apprehender. Okay? Repeat that again, would you please? Word exact for word. word. Exact same word. <laughs> <laughs> A little slower. Play it back. The Play it back, arts, George. The arts are bound up with the moral ascent of the... <laughs> the one who creates and <laughs> <Say it>. <laughs> <laughs> My thought, I had to give, come out to the book, the body is good enough. <laughs> now, with this state, when man, when man is in the state of apprehending divine beauty, he becomes estranged to the society that is earthbound. And therefore, he becomes separate and misunderstood by that society, but very much appreciated by the ecclesiastical college of people who think the same way. Therefore, there is polarization of the ascetic, who is also <coughs> aesthetic, and the man who is of the earth. Now, when 1054 occurred, and the, the, the Orthodox continued gazing into the paradise, the West began to create a better society. Their concern was to make it better. One of the first things popped up is this, which we now are clear obvious uh, uh, sort of victims, is that each family had, since it was required from each Christian, to expose the soul to the day of the sacral services, you know, every three hours. Therefore, <coughs> that each family had an oratory in which they would hollow, conceal, worship, present the images, the icons and so on, which hint at this other worldliness, this other thing where he comes from and goes to. And that very oratory, or little chapel, was a part of a family, a part of daily family. And with the pragmatic rise of pragmatic society, that was removed. And what was installed in its place? <coughs> outhouse. <laughs> because the outhouse, <laughs> you are not supposed to go to outhouse to go to bathroom viewing icons, because our house is bound up with that element which is earthly, earthbound, and is going to, so it's a process of decomposition, Deco decompose, it's going to be away, finished, there's not, not no part of us. So therefore, it's supposed to be out from the house. In English, you have a good term, out house, which is outside of your house outside of your holy place where the children are born in order to become saints. You understand? There's no place. But with the society that has removed itself from church, they got rid of the, or the orator in place. You'll say, Father Herman, you are perhaps very <laughs> outdated, but you have to understand the principle. Because if you are operating in your family, and your, your chapel is there, lamps, flicker, and censer is going on. You get one feeling. And when you sit and next door, neither, is a flush toilet like in Soviet Union, they don't have any 
and the ventilation. If you go to the bathroom, you open the door, all the fumes come right into your apartment. And then, since you, the windows are locked, it goes right into the hall. So therefore, the hall is filled with these fumes. And, the, and therefore, you come into the apartment, the first feeling is <laughs> sewer. That is not, re, that's not the, the refinement of the human soul which Christianity is talking about. See what I mean? Now, arts are bound up with that. Because arts is expressing of one's ideal for God. Therefore, when the separation took place, God sent to the eastern countries a whip in the form of Tartars and Muslims and Turks. And they persecuted and tormented Christians, but Christians had to go through great difficulty in order to preserve their own identity which was holiness. While in the West, there was no persecution. Oh, they had Lombards here and there, but, but it wasn't. And therefore, they enjoyed freedom. And that freedom, that peace and tranquility, only gave rise to the secularism, to the state when lay mentality, this humanistic approach, would overshadow Christian pathos, these arts. <coughs> and the result is that these arts began to reflect earth. The arts were the design to reflect paradise, began to reflect earth. Thus, you see maybe very refined paintings of um, um, uh, Rembrandt and so on, but that's earth. That's not like this. That has nothing to do, like for instance, these abnormally long figures. The whole intent is to idealize. When you see this, you're quite different <coughs> from Dürer's painting. We have here in one person who adores the Dürer. He ran away again. Uh, not here. Sure enough, he can't stand. <laughs> where nothing but warts, perpetual warts, and all these broken limbs come all over. The, the, the principle, I'm not sort of giving a whole, what is this, see? The ideal form, a, res, a restraint, um, and if you look at their faces, they're actually gazing into another world. There's a special way of painting it. So when you look at them, and the eyes are <coughs> open. They don't quite look at you. And if they do, it's usually depicting contrition of heart. And, if you're in, and it's created in order to have a message when you're in a state of prayer. When you do not smell the sewer. But on the contrary, you smell incense. When you hear in your heart, see here is rather than some kind of, some kind of saloon. Tingle tango girl saloon music. See? <laughs> Now, to come, down, to come to the upper. Another aspect of art was, <coughs> as I said, theater. Theater was totally <coughs> overshadowed by church. And uh, it remained in the realm of fairs or um, vaud, sort of like a cheap vaudeville, some kind of a thing which was sort of cheap entertainment uh, on a very um, a low level for kids or something like that, almost like puppet show. And <coughs> the seriousness of art, of theater, remained mostly almost unnoticeable in church, except for those church services that were bound up with dramatization, like the canon of Annunciation. You notice this? And the angel said, and Mary replied, and the angel said, and it's supposed to be too different, it's supposed to sing a special tone and song. If you will leave once more, you'll get into deep trouble because I'm going to stop and you'll have to continue. And you will not be talking about Mickey Spillane. <laughs> Next. On in the West, therefore, the, the ecclesiastical realm <coughs> continued, but they <coughs> began to apply, use these human <coughs> earthly elements 
installed in church, like the instruments in, in church, you cannot use in church, you cannot use instruments. Why? Because they are there, who knows? Why can't you use instruments in the church? Yes? Because they're breathless. They're breathless. Mm -hmm. And like every breath, praise the Lord. Mm -hmm. It's about because the highest instrument is human voice. Joan Sutton. And so on. <laughs> these, these, um, those instruments were Old Testament, although we have in Psalms, we have in the Vespers in some matters and so on. But there, that's an element which can evoke human passions because they are bound up with um, this voiceless instrument and the human voice should praise the Lord. The praises of the Lord should be human. But they began to use instruments. They began to use perspective in art. They began to use church, some of the churches, like especially the Rococo churches in Germany, they are very dramatic, very theatrical. They use the subject as clouds and saints and so on, but the whole thing is very dramatic, almost like drapery before in front of some kind of a operatic um, uh, performance, which actually it was. And to make it clearer is that the development of music, I understand Brother Gregory gave me the whole thing, right? Michael, yes. the development of music was to, to make it very simple is this, that music was uh, monophonic and so on, in order to, first of all, evoke a state of contrition. All this wailing and crying, you know, we have that in the uh, Middle East, that the whole principle is that otherworldly soul is crying for the Lord. When I cry in the Lord, you know, Lord, uh, um, and the uh, uh, Vespers. Now, that's why they're very often in minor keys. And uh, in eight tones, actually, the four major, four in major key. But the other so called plagal of the first, which actually, which is what, the fifth tone, it's actually in minor <laughs> key. Now, <clears throat> the music. Therefore, was the music was in old uh, in the theaters in those Greek theaters they had music they had instruments and so on music plays, but in the West the development of music went through pre-Renaissance, then Renaissance, which already began secular art, secular music. Before there was no secular, we just just folk dancing when you have a party in the, in the village. That's about it. But uh, they began to use, in the West, began to use music <coughs> outside of church <coughs> for dancing and so on. It continued and the intent was, which has some value to that, is to uplift the person. For example, the high society uh, <coughs> concerts the attempt was to gather them, have a nice dinner, and then some kind of refined music in order to refine their souls and revive the music and so on. The intent was to refine the soul, even on secular level. It developed into, um, in the, after part of the Renaissance, you have the Baroque period. And Baroque period, the idea is to have more intricate Mel uh, melodies or construction of melodic lines, sort of flowery. Most dramatic of that would be Rococo again, but which is also in uh, pictorial art, in the musical too. But after that, there occurred the attempt, not so much in music, uh, to make et um, intricate uh, um, um, melodies and so on, which Bach was excelling, although he was using for religious purposes, see? But the next step was, forget about the religious instant, use music for its own sake in order to achieve the finest, finest expression of human soul. And that would be Mozart. The attempt was, that's what it's called, the classic period. Because the attempt was music for its own refinement. Ultimately, God. But there also the dancing of the human soul, sure. 
But that was a tent. And in the beginning of 19th century, 19th century, the, when the music sort of began to develop in a more stronger way, then came in Beethoven, who decided to use music to express his own feelings, his own passions, his own murderous thoughts, and used music to express that, and thus became the expressionist, or called, or we call it romantic music, because he was uh, uh, approaching using music to express the uh, passionate state of romance, which is a, a re revival of um, uh, uh, ro uh, romantic. Uh, it's a whole big thing. It continued in the whole of 19th century to the expressionism with Debussy and others. In other words, the romantic period in, mu in music was an attempt to use music to express, although very refinely, to express passionate states. And therefore, the common works which they did, especially so-called oratorio. Oratorio is a, is a work uh, where you have a chorus and full orchestra and individual soloists in order to express usually a religious play or religious story, but without drama. As opposite when you put drama acting, that would be <coughs> opera. The original attempt in those Renaissance period especially was to depict a religious theme. Like in this oratorius you have a by handle, you have many religious subjects that the whole book of <coughs> Esther or um, uh, Balhazar or um, Judah Mac Maccabees, the book of Judas Maccabees is that, and he uh, presents it in uh, duets and trios and so on, very refined beautiful music, is an attempt to grip your soul and so on, but on a secular level. But then in the 19th century, the arts became so strong and so overwhelming and overshadowed the church, the meaning of it, to such an extent that good Christian people decided to use the media of opera to convey a religious <coughs> feeling or, as the original Greek plays, to have this catastasis in order to <coughs> express through music, through the play, a special story that will change your life. <coughs> that will be so strong, so emotional, that you will be so gripped by that, that your life will be changed. The attempt was made by many Italian, especially, um, composers, especially 19th century, who took some kind of very dramatic stories and <coughs> put, it's a play, made a play, and put it to music. And it has, opera is considered the ultimate art, because it contains the story, or the dramatic story, the play, which usually is written in poetry. So it has a rhythm and rhyme and uh, an attempt to convey certain things which simple words cannot do <coughs> by like poetry. It's a special, special <coughs> strength there. Then you have the visual. You have the decoration, various scenes, costumes, uh, mm -hmm. lighting, in order to give you a picture come alive. And the third, which gives a third dimension, is music. And music used as language. That is, the sounds of instruments are used as language. So by putting a certain melody in a certain instrument, you get a particular message. Which, it, and therefore you don't need words. Therefore the words will say something else. While the music already explains the whole thing to you, conveys, or sort of reveals, it hits your soul, and your soul is gripped with a particular message. While the singing going on something else. Now, the purpose of that was this ultimate art and how its opera justifies itself, because comic opera does not justify itself, pardon me. Uh, it's sort of making it fun. The opera con conveys a particular story, and since it's a Christian society, it conveys a Christian message which aids to the gospel message. That's its 
justification. In other words, they take the story of a fallen woman. <coughs> we know Mary of Egypt. <coughs> we know Mary Magdalene in the, the, the New Testament. A uh, repentant woman. And so this particular composer takes the story of this fallen woman, makes it a play accessible to every person, and then through music, through <coughs> highly uh, <coughs> melodic, lilting <coughs> melodies, using the messages through the instruments, conveys her repentance. And the result is at the end of the opera, the whole, movie, the whole opera theater weeps. The job is achieved. People come out of that repentant and softer. There is a case of a young man, who was a teenager, was suicidal and accidentally <coughs> got into the movie theater <coughs> and uh, was an opera made, made an op Italian opera made into a movie and he was so gripped that he was changed and later became a monk <coughs> thanks to this particular worldly, mind you, opera. Yes? Could you name a couple that um, <coughs> you think are worthy of that that The one that moved such <coughs> individual it's called La Forza del Destino by um, Giuseppe Verdi. The one about the fallen woman is La Traviata, which actually means the lost one, the fallen one. Then there's a great one that, of course, they take Shakespearean plays. There's Macbeth, Othello, uh, Rome and Juliet, uh, very well. Then there's a fascinating subject, which is very important now, now, nowadays, is the Faust, the opera by Charles Gounod, French composer, French national composer. It's about, you know, the, the Faust, the one who sold his soul to a devil in order to retain a youth. <coughs> and he seduced a pure virgin girl. And through her prayers, he was redeemed. Okay. There's a whole lot of wonderful operas, but at the same time, there are a lot of operas which are, strictly speaking, again returned to the pagan world. One of them is Richard Bach, <coughs> although he is a very talented uh, composer, one of the most talented composers, very original uh, musician and so on, very strong personality conveyed, but he was not Christian. He lost the Christian pathos, and therefore <coughs> his operas, even though when he takes this, some kind of a Christian subject, of the Parsifal, of the Grail, it doesn't come out Christian, it comes as a revival of the paganism. Modern times have not have brought many good options. Perhaps there is an attempt, I was not fortunate to see them. Or even when I listened, I did not find great satisfaction because Christianity does not come across to this thing. The Christian pathos, this <coughs> redemptive quality, does not come to there. And therefore I pay no attention because it's clearly a simply a product of Western decadence. But some of them, some especially composers, took great pain, create works of art which cost them their own lives. Some of them went crazy, like Donizetti, he wrote 50, 70 three uh, operas, and finally went crazy, uh, in which exceedingly profound <coughs> ideas are embodied through very, so almost primitive, simple, lilting music. He was very talented in conveying this passionate state of man who is confronted with either truth or valor or love or passion or something. And when he's confronted with them, he has a Christian reaction to it. That's why it's very, very inspiring to see and especially listen to them, to these operas, because there is a definite Christian message comes across through music, mm -hmm. even the story is painted. Now, tonight I'm going to show you here, a Russian opera composed by 
Mussorgsky. Um, he was, he died 1881, was a talented <coughs> man, but a drunkard. Or rather, he was alcoholic because he had, um, I guess just, I guess Russian schnapper or something. Um, <laughs> very talented and very original thinker. Briefly about him is this. He, like many great Russian uh, personalities, were very much passionately moved by big ideas. And being talented, they began to worship it. Of course, they had God and all that, but they were so overwhelmed by big ideas. He was overwhelmed by the idea of to create an opera which would not have a hero, <coughs> but the nation would be hero. And that this particular story would, in sounds, <coughs> would be very close to the reality. For example, he deliberately, even though it's a 20, it was 19th century Russia, very modern Western society, he depicting the story that took place in um, the 17th century, it's a historic figure, but he's good to know, uh, he was interested to present throughout the opera a feeling of patriarchal society. Therefore you have these cornices and these beiges coming up and so on, the whole atmosphere, how they lived at that time. The sound, he was interested in sound, a uh, point of um, um, uh, detail. In that story by Pushkin, there is a character who is fool for Christ's sake represents actually actual man who lived at that time was Nicholas Salas in Pskov, although it's placed in different position. And he, in order to make on the stage a sound that would be true to a fool for Christ's sake, he deliberately traveled to a place where there was gathering a fool for Christ's sake. He was to be heard. And he hid in the bushes the places where these fool for Christ's sake passed by or talked and so on. And he <coughs> took notes. <coughs> and he took it down. He sat there and took it down. So that the authentic sound, his theory was this. God created the world so beautiful that each sound, <coughs> if properly depicted, in our speaking or in the woods and the ocean roaring and all that, each sound is a masterpiece. But we are so insensitive, so crude, so prosaic, that we do not, do not hear this wonderful thing. He even concluded that human talk is a melodic, everyone, every nation has a different melodic phrases when you talk. <laughs> In other words, there's a particular line that goes on. Each has a different approach. When, you, when he talks, listen carefully. It's almost like Brooks. <laughs> See? When Mother, when mother uh, uh, Sophia talks, it's just silence. <laughs> <laughs> she tries to exercise EC. So his point was that the sound, if you're carefully, you can depict reality through sounds. <coughs> therefore in this opera, he would therefore became sort of a, a novelty. Because he was interested not so much in learning one melody after another, he was interested to convey a message that this person has it through sound, not so much through idea, but through sound, through pattern of, of repetitious sound. And his attempt was to depict a society that has been gone, that as patriarchal society, pre, I say Vatican too, pre, ten, yeah, schism, 1054. Therefore, one person went to see an opera and said, Oh, it was like being in church. See? 
I just threw like I stood for two, for two, for three hours in church, same field. Now, when he created this, with the help of his friend, Rips, of course, who felt sorry that he would get so excited and started drinking, and then he would stop from being to write anymore. So you have to get him excited to write, and then take the booze away. And then he goes, ah, oh, oh. then it goes, up. and he reaches for the booze, he takes it away, and he goes, great, great, great. But the moment he grabs the booze, that's the end. See? So Rimsky Korsakov helped him. He deliberately said, I'm going to be your roommate. We'll share an apartment together. So he would deliberately lock the booze and see to it that it doesn't go out. And the both would create opulence at the same time. And he would come up with these ideas. In other words, it's not just regular um, opera but an, an, an attempt to, through sound, through singing out, to bring you closer to that reality which was in 17th century, which was actually mentality of pre-1054. He wrote this work, and when he presented it to the state uh, opera theater, they said, certainly, well, that's impossible. It's not interesting. There's not a single <coughs> heroine, for example, not a single woman. There are women pop up here and there, but there's no the display of what's the best thing about opera? Girls! <laughs> screaming girls, that's the best part. <laughs> <laughs> and so there's not a single screaming girl. See? So um, they say, no, we can't spend all that money. It's a huge, long thing. It's not worth it. Then Rinzi Korsakov decided to make a party. He called all those people that he felt would be instrumental in uh, producing this up. He gathered them all, and he said, all right, now everybody's going to take champagne. You drink champagne. Now listen, this man, this drunkard, wrote a stunning opera. I'll play you some parts. And he played. And one of the <coughs> guests was an opera singer, um, uh, the you know, prima donna. So the whole opera depends on her. And he was, she was there. And she says, <coughs> Great opera, but I don't have any place in it. <laughs> I would love to bring this love. Why don't you create? Why don't you create a scene and put me there? And I'll say, I'm all done. And you create this thing, and then I'm going to tell the opera directors. I'll say, nothing doing. I'm not going to sing anymore. Anything. If you'll put that opera, then I'll sing the rest of it. Say, other eyes. And so it worked. They put this thing on, they created this special fountain scene, which we'll see. It's bound up with the Polish, Polish princess who wanted to become a uh, queen of Russia. And she could be if this false Dimitri is helped by the Roman um, Catholics, will be able to come to Moscow with a whole army and pronounce himself the Dimitri who was killed. And she will be his wife. See? So she agrees. He persuades her at first, but then she agrees. Um, the story is not too hard to understand what's going on, although it's all in Russian. And uh, <laughs> there are subtitles, so you can figure it out. The actual, you're not supposed to hear the sound. But the point of this man was that he wanted to, it's sort of like a super up, not just up, it's super because there's a bigger thing to it than just this stuff. And when you, and the, and, the, and the composer actually wrote another one, which will you probably, you'll, see, you'll hear another one of his, called Havanshya, which deals with the old believers phenomenon. It's with the old believers who were uh, ultra-conservatives. There was this modernist in church, ultra-conservatives, which is actually a very, active, very uh, serious phenomenon, We'll talk later, about, later on about that. Um, we have a temptation in our 20th century authors. We have temptation, all believers' temptations. See? So that's a necessary <coughs> subject for our course. But to end up on that thing is this. You are expected to know that arts are to be tools in the pastor, in the church. And the logical question is, how come 
that nothing of that is apparent in today's ecclesiastical structure. And to answer that question to Father Philip is the following. It is much safer <coughs> to sit in your church <coughs> and to do your, your daily sacral <coughs> services and don't bother too much, figure out how your, fo how your flock is <coughs> suffering here and there, what, what, what they're doing. Much easier. Concentrate on sensing, on your daily <coughs> sacral services, and you'll be all right. Just do what the bishop says and you're okay. And the result is this. Church, therefore, an embodiment of ecclesiastical <coughs> creativity, becomes imprisoned by outdated, small-minded, Clerics who are afraid to change souls. <coughs> if you don't like that answer, I can <coughs> elaborate just a little bit more. That's a pretty good answer. Because in our <laughs> churches today, when you come to church, you see clearly that people are conservative, very much afraid to go and to like street mission or somebody in trouble, or to figure out why is he having trouble? What's his problem? The church, the pastor is supposed to know, figure out what's He can figure out only if he knows what kind of work he does, where he lives, what, he, what, what are his inspirations. And you have to risk your own sort of <coughs> tranquility by perhaps you'll bite you back. Perhaps you're an alcoholic. We have to do something, help him out and figure out why that happens. In other words, this pastoral zilka, <coughs> this element, the pastoral element, is creative. So a pastor, by being a pastor, he has to be creative. If he's creative, he'll automatically support the arts. Because the, the seat of the <coughs> arts is within the church. The seat of the, the legitimate, the original, the perfect arts is within the church because it's bound up in the church and the church, the soul is bound up in the church. Is that clear? Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. Now be aware, there will be a test on this subject. <coughs> and I would like very much you to get the principle. Discuss this this weekend with your friends and figure out how you're going to answer those questions. Because if you will fail this <coughs> test, that means I fail. <laughs> and if you have any mercy on me, you're going to study, you understand? And there's no, no for, I won't take no for an answer. Okay. Okay, now, um, take a break, get ready, put the chairs on, and we'll start the show.